tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening, you're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to Season 7, Episode 20. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and in this episode, I'll be performing four spine-chilling tales for you, all of them from author K.B. Hurst, about holiday horrors, occult atrocities, insidious inspiration, and demonic discoveries. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two terrifying tales. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail... So lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> Our first tale tonight from K.B. Hurst introduces us to James, a hardened criminal that has just done something awful. To evade capture, he hides out in an old, run-down apartment, only what he finds is something even worse than the murderous act he just committed. Despite the title of our next tale, this gentleman isn't spreading any joy to the world this holiday season. Without further ado, I present to you a Christmas angel. Garbage lined the quiet street with dirty diapers, bottles, and cans. One trash bin tipped on its side with a wretched smell of old beer and cigarettes from behind a bar that overlooked a small alley. A slight breeze blew down the rundown alley of the city that seemed to have long forgotten snow angels, Santa Claus, and the meaning of Christmas. The sound of footsteps appeared from nowhere, a thundering shatter against the wet pavement that seemed to make the rats run toward an old sewer drain. A child's red tennis shoe hovered just above the edge of the drain. No one ever wondered where it came from. It was just there. You ever see an item of clothing on the side of the street and wonder what the story was behind it? In the case of the mysterious shoe, there was a story that wanted to be told. The footsteps continued until they reached the back of the old town tavern, Bar and Grill. He stopped suddenly to look around in a panic. From there, he looked up at a small window that was cracked not too much, just enough for an easy break-in. The building was completely dark, and he assumed it was just wasted office space above the bar. The man seemed to be running from something, if not to something. He'd cased the place too quickly, or he would have never made the entry into this establishment. James had just robbed the corner market, blowing the man's brains out that stood behind the counter. 
The image still burned inside his mind as he ran toward the back of the bar. James knew he'd be facing life in prison. It wasn't meant to be this way. He'd fallen on hard times recently. Drugs became his only way of surviving the harsh reality that had become his life. Using the tipped-over trash bin as a stepping stool, he managed to climb up and stick his fingers inside of the hole in the glass. He moved as quickly and as quietly as he could, unlocking the latch to slide the window open. Why anyone would think this would keep a stranger out, let alone the man in question, was a mystery. Once inside, he realized that it was someone's home. Why on earth would anyone live there? It was a dump. There were dog or cat feces in the room, and on the floor was a mattress. He grew sickened when he realized that it was a makeshift child's bedroom. On the wall above the mattress were drawings, and a stuffed animal was lying on the bed. A dim light was coming from down the hall. James smelled something that sickened him. He'd nearly lost his breakfast of beer and old french fries. He hadn't had a proper meal in weeks. James walked slowly down toward the hallway, and the smell grew worse, making him want to run back out the window. Something made him keep going. Perhaps this was his punishment for killing the man at the store. The older man had been nice to him on many occasions— the store owner would allow him to take food out occasionally, but this one night James needed the cash. He was ready to come out of his skin the way so many junkies were. There were far worse things in this world as he would soon find. Making his way further down the hallway, he began to smell what could only be described as death. James covered his mouth and nose in disgust as he made his way toward the end of the hall. He wasn't sure what he was looking for, but he knew that most likely the owner of the bar lived here. Cash was still necessary. James had panicked too quickly after shooting the older man. He ran too soon before he could take what little money there was in the drawer. So James found himself in this building with the smell of hell in his nose. He walked further, and there was a door half-cracked with a small lamp on illuminating a low light. The room was where the smell was coming from as it encapsulated his nose, making him sick instantly as he opened the door. It squeaked as it slowly revealed the horrors from within. Three bodies were sitting on a couch. One was a woman, the other was of a man, and the third... He didn't even want to look at her. The third was the body of a child, and the two adults covered in death with coagulated blood. He slowly closed the door when he heard a tiny voice cry out. Hello? Did he now hear things? Was his guilt haunting him? Can you help my mommy and daddy? James froze in terror. Was she a ghost come to collect his soul after what he had done? Hello? He heard her squeak. She sounded hoarse. Then he heard a cry. The little girl was no ghost. He opened the door, and he saw her tiny frame standing between the two dead bodies of her parents. Are you Santa Claus? James looked at her for a second. He didn't understand until he happened to catch a glimpse of himself in the mirror, hanging on the wall in the small room. He had a full gray beard that was nearly white to go along with his long, wavy white hair. Strange for someone in their early forties to have achieved such an accomplishment. James recalled getting his first gray hair in his early thirties, and his father said it was a sign of wisdom. He didn't believe that. It was a load of shit. He didn't say anything as he looked down at the little girl. She wore one red tennis shoe, the other God only knew. The apartment was cold, and he could see she had not eaten in days. Instead, she tugged at her shoestring while she talked to James, the only way a small child could. "'Where's your other shoe?' he asked her, managing to smile. 
I lost it when the bad man tried to take me with him. I had to get back to Mommy and Daddy. He dropped me, and when I woke up, I was here. He's gone now. He made Daddy give him all our money for Christmas. Then he made Mommy cry. She stopped crying. Talk about hard luck. The family had already been robbed. The killer deserved to be caught, but he would be long gone by now. James deserved to be found out, too. It was Christmas, which he only realized when he looked at the calendar on the wall on the tiny living room. Looking around, James noticed a childlike drawing of a Christmas tree hung on the wall, and hand-drawn ornaments decorated it in crayon. He wanted to die, certainly. He thought of the man at the store, and he too had a family. James looked at her, blinking into focus. He picked up the little girl, and they walked out of the room. They continued down the hallway to the stairs and descended them. His heart was breaking for this child. Tears wet his eyes, and then she wrapped her arms around his neck, feeling the safety and the warmth of his neck. A neck covered in tattoos, and even though he smelled from not bathing in days, she nuzzled her head inside of his neck. He gathered it felt better than being in this room with decaying carcasses. He wasn't sure where he was taking her. When he got out into the cold, he heard sirens just up the street. James knew they'd be looking for him. There were cameras in the store where he'd killed that man. James heard a sound suddenly, and when he turned around, he saw something that he would never understand till the day he died. A woman and a man stood by the sewer drain. Behind them was a light that reminded him of what it must be like to go to heaven. A woman and a man watched him, seemingly untainted by humanity. There was something otherworldly about them. The woman had long brown hair, and her cheeks had a creamy ivory glow to them. The man had bright blue eyes, and they smiled at him. James recognized them now as the ghosts of the little girl's parents. James felt the child growing limp in his arms. Then he saw a little girl appear between the man and the woman. It couldn't be the same little girl he carried in his arms. It was, and when he looked down at the child, she too was now as dead. James stood in bewilderment. You have shown an act of true human kindness. I don't understand. She was just here talking to me. James began to cry and his voice grew hoarse. The woman and the man approached him. They placed their warm hands upon his shoulder. Everyone deserves a second chance, the man said. He tried to save me, the little girl said, placing her pink hand inside of James' dirty one. Thank you. You're my angel. Within moments, James found himself back in that corner store, staring at the man as the gun was nearly about to go off. James blinked as though he were in a dream. Shit! He dropped the gun. Son, are you okay? Asked the old man. I, I don't... I'm, I'm sorry. Hey, come back. I can find someone to help you. James backed out of the store, running into traffic. He almost knocked over a woman ringing a bell for the Salvation Army. "'Merry Christmas!' he yelled as he ran by. As he ran, he began to smile, realizing that angels had to be real, and he was saved by one. James turned his life around that night. He realized that life was short and precious. He had no one to thank but the little girl who saved his life. A Christmas Angel. Tonight's episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is brought to you by BetterHelp. With Christmas just around the corner, normally this is a joyous time of year for most people. However, for many, it can be a very difficult time emotionally. Loneliness compounding things, especially this year. I know in the past, for me, I sometimes felt this way, for various reasons. The holiday season just wasn't all that joyous. 
A comforting voice to help put things into perspective was really helpful. That's where BetterHelp can allow you to sort things out. And they even have a deal to help you get started with 10% off your first month. BetterHelp isn't just self-help, but professional counselors who assess your needs, then match you with your own licensed professional therapist, connecting safely and privately online. You can begin in under 24 hours, and you can message them at any time. BetterHelp's goal is to facilitate great therapeutic matches, and they have the flexibility allowing you to change counselors and connect with one that you are totally comfortable with. Best of all, you can do it from home with either a scheduled weekly video or phone session. Plus, you can access them from anywhere in the world. Another plus is the vast range of expertise offered that may not be available locally to you. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. An additional bonus is they're very affordable, offering financial aid if you need it. If you want to start living a happier life today, as a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash horror. Join over 1 million people who've taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash horror. Tell them that Otis sent you, and thank you for your support of our sponsor and this program. I hope you enjoyed A Christmas Angel, as written by author K.B. Hurst and performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that first tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support them by picking up a copy of their latest book, the first in a series entitled Helltown Experiments, available now on Amazon, along with their debut book, Wicked William, My Ouija, My Friend. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Hearst. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash Hearst, spelled H-U-R-S-T. And you'll be redirected to the author's profile on our horror fiction website, creepypastastories.com, where you can learn more about this talented writer or connect with her via her official website and social media and find a convenient link to Amazon where you can buy your books today. As an Amazon associate, a portion of your purchase made via clicking that link, by the way, comes back to help us support this show as well as the author. Hearst's latest, Helltown Experiments, takes us back to 1974, when the government took over nearly 33,000 acres of land and converted it into the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. It forced the many residents off their property, and rumors of strange experiments that took place in an underground government facility became the thing of legend. Only those with the will to survive in a place named after hell itself are bound to survive in such a place. But at what cost? Helltown Experiments is their story, and you won't regret getting a copy today. Again, purchase your copy of the book today at simplyscarypodcast.com slash Hearst and click Amazon or the image on the book's cover further down the page. You won't be sorry you did. And when you do, be sure to leave a five-star review and a kind word and let the author know you heard about her here on this show. Thanks again for your support of this show and of tonight's featured author. Up next, we've got a second tale of terror for you, courtesy once again of K.B. Hurst. In it, we'll meet Eddie, a retired Vegas magician now working in RV sales. As fate would have it, he's approached one day by a young man offering him a job doing one more gig. Only it isn't the type of magic show he's used to performing. Their brand of entertainment, as he'll soon find, is far less rooted in sleight of hand and far more sinister. Without further ado, I present to you Magic vs. Magic.
Three years ago, I was in a class of highly respected magicians. Every sleight of the hand, trick of the lighting I have seen and replicated. I once even won a large sum of money on one of those television programs as a runner-up. I had a gig for 20 years where I worked in a small venue in Las Vegas on Tuesday nights, and I made a decent income doing bachelorette parties during the rest of the time. I finally retired shortly after my 56th birthday because no one really wants to watch an old man try to crawl out of a locked barrel. It was firmly set in stone when I tripped over one of the bars we used in the old I-can-make-you-levitate routine. So I retired and decided to get a non-entertaining gig, RV sales, which often require a different sleight of hand. I was discussing what could be a very good sale for a used RV when a young man interrupted my conversation. He was lanky and had shaggy light brown hair. He was annoying on first glance as he stood there and smoked a cigarette blowing smoke in my direction, all the while a cellular up to his ear. "'Hey, you're the guy from the blue room, ain't you?' he asked, snapping a photo of me with his cell phone. "'Oh, man, I got great news. Talk soon,' he said into his phone and quickly tossing it into his pocket. I'd been recognized before, and usually I'd just pull out my deck of cards, do a quick trick, and they'd have a good laugh and move on. So I said, excuse me, to the gentleman I was trying to sell the flashy RV, with all the bells and whistles to, and asked the customer if he could be so kind as to wait while I finished with this gentleman. Nodding, he kept his eyes on me intensely as he watched me, from behind the sign next to our business. I finished the sale, which only took me 35 minutes, as the customer paid in cash, and then I watched the customer drive off in his new RV. I turned back, and there was the guy still waiting for me. I laughed and pulled up my deck of cards while I twiddled my white mustache. Pick a card, young man. He just stared at me, and instead of picking a card... He looked right at me intensely. I have other tricks up my sleeve, I joked. He's perfect, the young man said to no one. It's about my lunchtime, I said, mildly annoyed at uh, this brief interaction. Here's my business card. Come back if you're interested in buying an RV. I was getting tired and my stomach growled. I began walking away when he put his arm out in front of me, stopping me in my tracks. You like it here? I know way you could make a very large sum of money. Better than what you make in sales here. Look, I'm about to go to lunch. Maybe come by another day? I said, trying to blow him off. Let me introduce myself. I'm Dan Carter, and I remember seeing your act a few years ago. Where are you going for lunch? It's on me. Just let me have 30 minutes of your time. I was too hungry to care if this guy bought me lunch. If he wanted to spend money on a stranger, who was I to stop? Luckily, the RV dealership was next to a 24-hour diner, and so we met there, taking a booth by the front of the crowded diner. A waitress came right over and took our orders, and then it was time to interact with this oddball. You're a magician by trade, the great Eddie Cavalier. Was. I'm retired now. Well, that's fine. But my boss is always on the lookout for new talent. We're in the business of some of the greatest showmen you'll ever meet. I've already consulted my boss, and he likes your portfolio of work. He remembered seeing you at the Blue Door. Your Phantom Act was particularly of interest to him. What luck finding you today. Look, I'm sure your boss is a great guy, and I'm sure he pays as good as the next venue. But I'm retired from the entertainment industry. Well, we aren't in the entertainment industry. We're actually paid paranormal investigators. Only difference is we create illusions for our customers to get out of certain types of contracts. I looked at this young man squinting in confusion. I don't think I understand, Dan. Well, it's pretty simple. We have clients that pay us for what we can do with ghosts. Uh, landlords, mostly. I can tell by the look on your face, you're still confused. Let me start from the beginning. 
For me and many others, getting older is more than just with age comes wisdom. There's also the issue of aches and pains, both mental and physical, and I was no different. For me, it was chronic pain due to a bad knee and not being able to sleep well, and for a number of decades, I just put up with it. I no longer have that problem thanks to Feels. Feels is a premium CBD product delivered directly to your doorstep, which helps reduce stress, anxiety, pain, and sleeplessness. And what a difference it makes for me. In the first few months after my knee joint replacement last year, I was lucky to get more than two or three hours of continuous sleep. Not anymore. Thanks to Feels, my pain levels are also under control as well. What's great is how easy it is to use. Place a few drops of feels under your tongue, then feel the difference within minutes. It is important to note though, it may take a bit of time to find your correct dose of CBD. Finding your correct dose is important, and everyone's dose is different, so leave room to experiment over the course of a week or so. You may need to take more or less to get the effects you're after. And we have a special deal for you. Become a member today by going to feels.com slash dark and you'll get 50% off your first order with free shipping. If you've never used CBD before, Feels offers a free CBD hotline to help guide your personal experience. The great thing is you can feel better naturally. Feels helps you feel better without any high, hangover, or addiction. And the best thing is you can join the Feels community to get Feels delivered to your door every month. You'll save money on every order, and you can pause or cancel at any time. Feels has me feeling my best every day, and it can help you too. Become a member today by going to feels.com slash dark, and you'll get 50% off your first order with free shipping. That's F-E-A-L-S dot com slash dark, D-A-R-K, to become a member and get 50% automatically taken off your first order with free shipping. That's feels.com slash dark, and let them know that Otis sent you. Thanks so much for your support of this show and our sponsors who help make my program possible. I listened to him as he explained to me how it worked. Here was the basic breakdown. When landlords couldn't get rid of squatters in buildings or non-paying tenants, they were called in as a bit of a last resort, most of their customers finding them through word of mouth. Even with the normal 30-day evictions, the tenants lingered or would trash the homes and apartments as a form of retaliation. Scaring them into disappearing on their own was the best, or so Dan said. I tried to keep my face from showing how amused I was listening to this insane proposition. Living in Vegas had taught me that nothing was too crazy. How do you do it? I mean, how is it the tenants don't know you're there? I sipped on my coffee, listening intensely. We get keys from the landlords and hide in areas of the homes, often setting up our equipment when they were at work. Sometimes we just hide in basements or attics. When 3 a.m. rolls around, the witching hour, as they say, that's when our show begins. Once we laid in wait for hours until a husband and wife had fallen asleep, with rats running across our feet while we were hidden in the attic of an old apartment building. I listened, and just as I was about to thank him for lunch, he paid, When he said something strange, we make a lot of money. We charge by the job, and the last one made us over 100 grand just for a small apartment building. The most recent job we've taken on is a rather large apartment building. Tenants need to be out of the property so it can be sold for a new hotel that was going in its place, and there are a few hangers-on that won't leave. Our last job, we scared them really good with our tricks. He chuckled, and then shoved a large bit of hash browns and gravy in his mouth. Isn't it dangerous? How so? I mean, you're pissing people off. What if you scare them so bad they attack you? What if they don't believe in ghosts? I understand your concerns. 
That isn't usually an issue. Dan grinned, cocking his head slightly. I find that hard to believe, young man. Let me just show you a trick, he said, winking. I sat there and watched him. He asked the waitress to come over. The older woman came over, smiling, and he pulled out his hand. It was completely missing. Just a bloody stump appeared in its place. I knew it was an illusion, and even if there hadn't been blood in it, it still would have been unnerving, to say the least. She was holding a pitcher of water and promptly dropped it upon viewing the stump. Standing up to help the waitress, I noticed on the floor by the water there were cockroaches in place of the ice cubes crawling about. Dan pulled out a handkerchief from his shirt sleeve and handed it to her. She wiped off the water from her cheek, and when she looked down, the cockroaches were gone, and so was the bloody stump. Now, using both his hands, he helped her pick up the ice. She looked distraught and had a hard time composing herself. I could see the confusion on her face. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not feeling well, she said, and one of the other waitresses helped her toward the back of the kitchen. I looked at him and smirked. How? Magic, he said with a smile. Come on. Not all tricks should be shared. He stood up and tossed me his card, walking out of the diner. It was my turn to feel bewildered. That evening I sat in my study thinking about what had happened. I didn't think I needed to bother calling. However, it was around noon the following day, dealing with some asshole customer who couldn't decide if he wanted to buy an RV because he still loved his old one, when I thought, maybe I could be doing something else. Some hours later, I found myself sitting in the same diner, staring into a cup of coffee. I pulled out the card and I looked at it. I called Dan. He arranged a meeting over the phone within minutes, and I was to meet his boss the next day to discuss things. I had to get at the approval of Dan's boss before he deemed me worthy to take me on. The meeting took place inside an old pawn shop on the edge of the city. I entered the tiny building, and it smelled of too many cigarettes and wasn't well lit. A bleached blonde-haired woman in her late forties met me, first with a handshake. I noticed her long red nails and her cleavage. She wore a bodysuit with a palm tree pattern and blue jeans. She told me to wait in the lobby, and Big Sam would be with me shortly. She chewed gum loudly, and I guess she was the receptionist. You're older than I thought. Thanks, I said, perplexed. Uh, no, honey, don't take it personally. Big Sammy has this way of recruiting kids off the street, and most aren't even done with high school. It's nice to see someone that isn't a kid. He's going to love that. Why is that? Because the young ones don't last. They always disappear after payday. I stood there looking at her as she licked stamps and stuck them on envelopes. You can sit, she said, pointing to a pink chair. I looked down and there was an orange cat sprawled out in the chair. Oh, oh that's Elvis. You can move him. I smiled and looked at him again. And the cat opened one of his eyes, which was emerald green, looking at me as if to say, Don't even think about it. Oh, Elvis, get up, go chase mice, she said, popping her gum loudly, picking up the fat cat, and placing him in the back of the office. She resumed her place at her desk, licking stamps and loudly chewing her gum. I took off my jacket and placed it on the chair before sitting down. The chair was ragged, stained, and covered in lumps of cat hair. I took a deep breath and played on my phone while I waited. It must have been another twenty minutes when the man they referred to as Big Sam finally came out. Sam was very tan and had long black hair, which was in a ponytail with bits of sweat pouring down his forehead. A thick gold chain necklace of a crucifix was hanging from his chest and bits of curly black hair stuck out from the top of his unbuttoned dress shirt. Big Sammy looked like every old mafia guy you'd seen in the movies. He handed a pile of papers to the receptionist, and then eyed me. Marty, he turned to the blonde woman, we have the great Eddie Cavalier in our presence. Please, sir, 
It's a great pleasure meeting you. Please, come in my office. He shook my hand heartedly, and I followed him. This is a real pleasure. I can't tell you how often I used to watch you in the Blue Room. Vegas is a town of many illusions, but you being in that RV lot that day Dan found you was one of the best yet. Maybe I should pinch myself. He laughed loudly. I smiled at him, but wasn't entirely sure what to say. Dan explained what we do here, right? Yes, although I'm not entirely sure what I'll be doing. Oh, no issue there. My boys will show you the ropes. Not that there are many you don't already know. When would I start? I asked. Tonight. I'll make sure you get a cut of the payment when I'm paid in full. Does it usually take that long to get paid? No, I can advance the payments if need be. But you have to stick it out no matter what. Big Sam doesn't like to get double-crossed. Big Sam spoke of himself in third person, as though he held himself in high esteem. So this was the racketeering operation they ran. I wasn't sure what brought me here, except for the promise of a large paycheck. They were like supernatural loan sharks. I wasn't sure about all this, and I could tell by the look on Big Sam's face. He meant business. I wondered if that's where some of those teenagers had disappeared to. Did they leave, or did something else happen to them? I didn't want to think about it. This is the most interesting thing that's happened to me in a long while, and I missed performing. This crazy scheme was probably the closest thing I'd ever get to getting paid to perform magic tricks. I thought about it, and then Big Sam, reaching into his drawer, pulled out a large wad of cash. He handed me a chunk of it. There's 5000 there, just to keep you quiet about this, in case you don't want to join our little troop. If you do, they meet up at midnight at this address. He wrote down an address and slid it across the table toward me. I smiled at Big Sam and he winked at me. So it's a deal? Yes. I exclaimed, none too happy to take the large sum of cash in front of me. We shook on it and that was the initial meeting. I half expected someone to jump me upon leaving because of the cash, but I managed to get to my car safely, and five thousand dollars richer. I decided I'd be going to meet these illusionists before I was handed the address of the location. I felt I owed myself that much. Who knew it could be fun, maybe? At exactly midnight, I pulled up toward the old warehouse. I expected there to be a small crowd of cars, but I didn't see anyone else. I turned on my brights to see if anyone else was around, and then I got a loud bang at my passenger side window startling me. When I looked over, I realized it was Dan. Turn off the lights. I complied and turned off the headlights. He juggled the handle to my passenger door, and I caught the cue and unlocked it. He got in and sat down and didn't say anything for a moment, looking around. That's when he told me to drive around the corner of the lot and park my vehicle. We sat in silence for another few moments, and then he addressed me. Never park in front of the place in question. Never use headlights or make noise. We're basically scoping the place out tonight. We've got to get a feel for what the schedules are of the tenants we have, and when the best time it is to set up and begin our operation. I think I'm finally starting to understand how this works. How long does it take to gauge? On average, a couple of weeks. But this place here should be empty. There's a few stubborn assholes who just wouldn't take a payout, so it's up to us to scare the living shit out of them. He laughed hysterically. Where is everyone else? Big Sammy said I'd be meeting some other guys. Oh, you will. After we all finish our shifts in a week, we compare notes. Our shift is midnight to 5 a.m., and then the next guys show up and so on. When the week is up, we meet with Big Sam and try to decide when to go in and set up. It was essentially a heist minus the theft. I sat there with Dan, watching the building until my eyes began to droop. He shook my arm and I looked down at his hand. 
A little pick-me-up? He held out a small bag of cocaine, and I shook my head. What about Adderall? I looked at him and laughed, pulling my coffee uh, I had next to me. Strictly caffeine guy. At my age, I may die of a heart attack. Oh, Sit yourself. He popped two Adderalls and then sat back. He was focused on the old-looking building, and I just tried to remain alert. What seemed like days instead of hours passed, and then the sun began to come up. That's when two headlights met my vehicle head-on. Dan was watching the building with a dazedly expression upon his face. I think we have company. Huh? He mumbled and then looked at me. Ahead. Oh, yeah, that's Marcus and Jet. We can go. I'll see you tonight. Same time, same place. With that, he got out of my car and disappeared into the early dawn's light. I drove home in a daze, perplexed at what I had just done for the last six hours. I wasn't sure I hadn't completely lost my marbles. They all made what we were doing seem natural. The following night was the same as the next. After a week of stakeouts, watching few of the tenants that were still living in the building, Dan declared it was time to set a plan into action. Originally, I was told Big Sam would hold a meeting to decide when to go in the building and set up our equipment. Dan seemed to have his own ideas. Dan called a meeting nearly a week and a half later and declared Big Sam gave his okay on our entering the building. I was a little uncomfortable going ahead since I hadn't seen Big Sam say it was okay myself, but Dan seemed to run things from the beginning. Dan was Big Sam's right-hand man in charge, and he'd found me and set up the meeting with Big Sam. I decided not to question it. We met in an old storage unit not far from town, surrounded by desert. Inside were hundreds of props used in magic shows. I recognized them all. They had a levitating table, hundreds of magic mirrors, fog machines, and multiple notebooks and blueprints, which I guessed were for the building layouts. Thanks for coming, guys, Dan said, pulling out a small bag of pills and popping three in his mouth and proceeded to open up a beer and chug it down. He took a deep breath and then belched loudly. No one seemed to find it as obnoxious as I did. The other guys looked as shabby as Dan. Dan wore a black leather jacket with black boots and goggles on his head. Jet was a tall, lanky guy with a black Snoop Dogg T-shirt on and tight black jeans. He wore saddle shoes like everyone used to in the 80s. He wore red-rimmed glasses and kept a green comb over his ear. He had leather gloves with the fingers hanging out. Marcus stood tall and wide, long blonde hair shaved in a mohawk, wearing a long black raincoat and a white tank. He, too, looked like a misfit of fashion, and all three combined looked like a really bad steampunk man. I sat in a short-sleeved dress shirt, polished brown dress shoes, with matching slacks, I felt overdressed. We haven't seen anyone there in two nights, began Marcus. But the old bag lady is still there with her nephew. I think there are two others, but they're in a gang. It's going to be hard to keep track of the gang activity coming and going at night, Jet said, rubbing his chin deep in thought. We can go in later today. I think if we dress as fumigation workers... No one will pay attention to us. We can easily get in. Dan said, pacing. That's suspicious. Three or four random workers all in fumigation masks? Marcus asked. Like Ghostbusters, laughed Jet. Not funny, Marcus said, rolling his eyes. Well, technically, we are fumigation workers, just a people. Jet said, adjusting his glasses. He pulled up a deck of cards and made them dance by themselves on the table in front of him. I watched him while I tried to figure out how he was able to move them so quickly. It wasn't your typical card trick. The cards flew out of his hand and onto the table and back into his hands. I shook my head blinking and then I thought of it. Painters. It's not unusual for painters to come in multiple numbers. I suggested, thinking it sounded as stupid as their idea. "'That's awesome,' said Dan, clapping his hands. 
The others smiled, nodding in agreement. Good job, old man, Chet said, patting me on the shoulder. Were they serious? It was a half-baked idea if I ever heard one. Dan grabbed a rolled-up blueprint off the floor and began mapping out where and how we would set up our magic tricks. They gathered everything up, and I noticed they didn't take any supplies with them except for a medium-sized chest. What do you want me to bring? What sort of tricks do you want me to perform? Dan patted me on the shoulder. Everything we need is in this box. I was confused, but being new, I didn't question it. We all got into what Dan lovingly called the shaggin' wagon. We threw on some painter's t-shirts and baggy pants. We drove to the building and parked the shaggin' wagon in the back. Dan put his steampunk goggles on, and they seemed to suit him even in his painter's uniform. He carried the blueprints under his arm, and Marcus carried the chest under his arm. Jed had a small backpack and pointed to a ladder from the back of the van for me to carry. I looked at Jed, confused. Has to look authentic. What painter doesn't have a ladder? He laughed. I shrugged off, grabbing the ladder, and walked up to the building following the others. We were able to enter the building completely undetected by any of the tenants that were left. The building already felt abandoned, even though we knew at least seven or eight people uh, that were still living in multiple floors of the apartment building. Walking down the halls, I couldn't figure out why anyone else still chose to live there. The walls were cracked and the ceilings leaked. Ants were everywhere, and on a few occasions while walking, I saw more than one roach scatter across the floor. Parts of it had garbage piled up from where the other tenants had already moved out and left it as is. No wonder the owner was selling this property to have it bulldozed. Dan found an entry to the attic area of the building that had a sign marked Hazardous Area. Dan parked the box on the floor, and the others settled in around him as they made themselves at home. Dan lit a cigarette, and the others sat around him doing their own thing. I stood watching them, trying to figure out where I fit in. Finally, Dan looked up at me and smiled. Eddie, we're going to be here for a while. Why don't you show us one of those cool card tricks? The others chuckled to themselves as they watched me. I nodded, smiling, ready to show them my card-on-fire trick. Dan picked a card, and after I shuffled it, I grabbed a lighter from Marcus, lighting the first card on fire, knowing it wasn't Dan's card. Burning it turned into the card Dan had selected. I did the trick at lightning speed. It was a simple trick of bait and switch. I watched the others watching me, and they laughed as I suddenly felt like an amateur. Marcus took out a coin, and he put it behind his ear. Looking over at Dan, he pulled the same coin from Dan's mouth. I chuckled as I'd never seen the trick done so closely. We killed time, showing each other magic tricks back and forth. Then, as we got tired, Dan took a look at his watch. It was nearing 3 a.m., and we could hear people yelling and laughing just below us in the hallway. Dan looked around the room and had an excited look upon his face, like one you would see on the Joker. Showtime, fellas! Marcus stood almost jovial, taking off his painter's uniform to reveal winged tattoos on his back that glowed in the dark. He put on a black shirt with a strange symbol in white on the front of it. Dan did his usual, a line of coke and a few pills to pump himself up. I'd gotten used to Dan's usage of drugs during the last couple of weeks. I anxiously watched them all changing clothes as though they were going into battle. Dan handed me a dark blue sweatshirt, and I put it on. I guess the theme was to wear all dark and blend in with the night. I looked over at Dan and Jet, who also wore symbols on the front of their shirts. They were different from the one Marcus had on, almost like sigils. I didn't understand what was going on, but I followed them as they grabbed the chest they brought with them. I watched as they all three snuck down from the ceiling in the dark hallway, there was barely any light because the landlord had most of the light bulbs removed as a deterrent from staying longer. 
I slowly followed them as they stood in the center of the hallway, and all three seemed to form a triangle. Dan was the first to move, and he opened the chest slowly, pulling out a pair of ten-sided polygon dice. Dan proceeded to roll the dice, and when he did, that's when I realized what he was doing. There was a light that appeared from the pair of them. The sides closest together moved in closer and connected to each other. After they moved in, the light went out, and that's when I could see it. Down the hall were two tall shadows. Jet then pulled out a mirror from his backpack, placing it in the center of where the dice were. The reflection of the dice in the mirror now faced the direction of the two shadows at the end of the long hall. The flickering lights were now completely off in the hall, pitch black. I heard a hissing, and then I realized the shadows were slithering like snakes up the walls and into the vents of the apartment building. Screams came from inside the walls all around us. Terror billowed out from every direction. Then I heard doors slamming and people running. I heard rattling above me in the ceiling where the vents were, and then I heard a gust of air as though someone turned on the central air. Then the sound stopped, and I heard nothing. The air was dry and cold after the screaming stopped. Then I heard something that sounded like someone running down the hallway toward us. It was so loud I thought whoever it was would run clear into me going at lightning speed. I saw a woman, older, wearing a ragged clothing, and as I went to move out of the way, Dan stopped me. She can't see or hear us. She's gone. Dan trailed off, and then I saw the woman running through the wall. Then a man, limping on a cane, fell into what seemed like a void that opened in the middle of the floor. Others came, and they disappeared into the ceiling like phantoms. I stood bewildered. This presentation had to be the best illustration of magic I'd ever seen. Was Dan doing this for my benefit? Was it a hologram? Then I felt it. A tremor surged through me. I bent over as its electric current kept me frozen in limbo. I couldn't move, and my eyes now closed, open to see what the cause of my convulsions was. I saw that Dan, Jet, and Marcus all were experiencing the same thing. Only the reason had me petrified to the bone. At the end of the hallway, those two slithering creatures were the cause. I had no idea how they were doing it, and I had no idea why we were subjecting ourselves to this. As I thought about this, I heard Dan speaking telepathically to me. Let it finish. Eddie, relax. It was as if he were getting high off the energy of the spirits, taking in their essence. The dice and the floor parted, and those shadows disappeared. A light at the end of the dark hallway flickered back on. I walked out of the building, confused and pale. I had no idea what happened to those people. But there was blood on the walls and the hallways, towel floors. I left in a hurried rush and planned never to look back, but I knew Dan would not let me go for whatever reason they needed me. Not to mention, my life was theirs now. If I tried to stop, they'd kill me. That much I knew. A few days later, I picked up a newspaper while I was out with Dan scouting our next set of victims. An article about four vagrants had been found drained of all their blood in an old apartment building across town. I knew instantly that it was the building that Dan and the others had me accompany them to in the newspaper article. I was angry that I had been lied to, and their so-called magic wasn't what they said it was, and whatever magic they were using was evil. It was magic I'd only heard about in fairy tales. I sat in the car with Dan looking out at the city as the people went to and fro. Dan received a phone call, then he began to drive away. Change your plans, Eddie, he said, speeding out of our parking spot and driving toward the hills. There was an old Tudor-style house with a perfect lawn. It had green grass that almost looked fake. It was so pristine. There was something about the place that looked as though the only occupants were ghosts. What's this place? 
Sonata Manor. It was the home of one of the country's top composers. The only occupant left is the old composer's daughter. Should be easy enough to get rid of her, Dan chuckled to himself. I was not too fond of the sound of that. I knew what Dan had up his sleeve after the bloodbath at the other house. Is all this necessary for one person? Yes, but we'll do things a bit differently. How so? I asked. It'll be faster. Dan smirked. The cash will be the biggest yet, but the payoff won't be as fun, though, Dan lamented. Whatever he meant by that. So that night we sat in our cars and waited for all the lights to go out. Jet and Marcus were ready, too. Uh, we got out of our vehicles, dressed like ninjas, all in black, so no one in the neighborhood would spot us. We climbed the trellis in the back of the house and then headed toward the attic. I managed as well as I could. Lord knew that I wasn't as limber as I once was at nearly sixty years of age, but I made do. When we were inside, all I could smell was old tobacco like my late grandmother used to smoke. She was half Native American from Kentucky and never let a day of hard work go by without her and her pipe. The other smell was much worse, like a funeral home. What's that smell, I asked. Who cares, old man? Let's just do what we came here to do. We did the usual setup. then at the darkest hour of the night. Dan and the others took out their dice. Once on the floor, they began to stand in order. This time Dan asked me to stand at the attic door so I could keep things in line. I felt my hands shake when the two dark figures appeared again. They were like ballet dancers, the way they weaved in and out of our circle, before descending into the cracks of the floor and down the walls as if made of light and shadow. We waited, and we waited. There were no screams of terror. Dan looked at me, worried, in his green eyes. "'Something's wrong,' he said, walking over to the two dice on the floor. "'What is it, man?' Jed asked, bouncing around like he was feigning for a hit of some kind. "'It should be done by now,' Marcus said, looking around. Marcus exploded then, before our very eyes. We were too shocked to be frightened. Blood covered our faces, and his insides left splashes of blood all upon the ceiling.' Dan looked at Jet and me and began to hold the dice, one in each of his hands. Go back to where you were summoned. He held his eyes shut tight, but nothing came. Then, in the doorway, appeared a woman who couldn't have been more than twenty at most. Are you looking for these, young necromancers? She asked, holding up two small shadows with some dark magic of her own. Dan pulled out a gun to my amazement and shot at her. Dan, what are you doing? Jet screamed. The bullets never hit the young woman. There was something about her eyes, something I couldn't place. She looked at me then. You aren't like them. But you must go and never come back. Eddie, no. Don't go, man. Don't listen to her. She's just a stupid blind bitch. Look at her eyes. Dan was nervous and I could see him shaking. The young woman had some dark power, that was for sure. It was darker than Dan and all the rest of them combined. I'm giving you seconds, old man, said the girl, and I did not stop to think. I went out the window to the attic the way I came in. I looked back for only a second, to my horror, to see Dan and Jet's entrails being ripped from their bodies, blood splattering the walls and my cheek, as I went out the attic window in the same manner I'd come. I went as fast as I could, not fully understanding what had happened, but having a fairly good guess. Some time passed, after which I returned to my sales job, selling RVs in the desert. I put my one mishap in an otherwise untarnished life away, hoping against hope that whatever I'd participated in, I'd be forgiven at the end of days. I was writing up a sales slip for a customer when I got a tap on my shoulder. Uh, give me just a sec. I stopped in my tracks. It was the young woman from the manor. My hands dropped the pen I was now holding. 
You're Eddie, am I right? She asked, chipperly. Um, yeah. How can I help you? Let's not play games. You know why I'm here, don't you? I want to tell you I'm sorry for what happened. I didn't know what was going on when I got involved with those guys. Save it. I don't care how you came about those men. I do, however, think we could be perfect partners. And what? I asked her. She pulled out a box and opened it. This time she had five dice inside it. I looked at her peculiarly at first, then she spoke. This was their first mistake. They didn't count on me being a witch. I eat necromancers and spirits for breakfast. I hope you don't mind. I added your three friends to their little collection. Time for them to work for us. What do you say? I was stunned and also alarmed. I'm out of the haunted house business. I said to her as sincere as I could be. I don't want to make haunted houses, silly. I want you to help me collect the bad spirits from them. They taste divine, and they give you a bit of a buzz, too. I thought back to Dan, and when he seemed to get a buzz off those people dying, she just wanted to eat their souls and catch a buzz, and I wanted no part of it. Come on, Eddie. I'll make it worth your while. I'm good, young lady. It isn't my thing. I hope you understand. The more bad souls that are eradicated, the better this pious world. Look, if you change your mind, here's my number. I think we could work together. When I looked down at the piece of paper she handed to me, I noticed that it had a moon and stars. Her name was Celine. I chuckled to myself because I was done with magic. I tossed the paper in the wastebasket, but when I looked up, she was gone entirely. There was no way she'd gone from here so fast. That was several years ago now. The whole thing has given me pause to stop over the years. I wonder how Celine is sometimes doing. Whether she realizes it or not, she saved me that day. She let me escape. It is strange, though, that once a year I get a box with the new dice in it. I put them away on a shelf and don't take them out. I know it's Celine that is sending them to me, and I understand why. She's hoping I'll change my mind and join her. The other day I got the most recent one, this one with a note. Eddie, one witch to another, won't you reconsider? Do you think no one knew your secret? Everyone knew it. You think we don't know how you got so famous performing tricks that no one can really do? See. I smiled at the letter. So what if it was true? So what if my magic was real? I'd never tell because a true magician never reveals their secrets. I hope you enjoyed Magic vs. Magic by author K.B. Hurst, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed the tales you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured author has some amazing books available to purchase now on Amazon.com. That includes Hurst's debut book, Wicked William. In the 2019 book, part one of his series, you'll meet Abby, a young woman that has always wanted to fit in with the girls like her best friend Cameron. Cameron has always been the popular girl with the perfect life, and one of her favorite pastimes is bullying her so-called friend Abby. That is until one day when Abby dabbles with an Ouija board, and in doing so, makes a new friend of the paranormal variety. And her newfound pal doesn't like the way Cameron treats Abby, and they're going to do something about it. Pick up your copy of Wicked William by K.B. Hearst today from Amazon in either the paperback or Kindle editions. And watch out for her other books, too. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Hearst. 
Once more, that's simplyscarypodcast.com slash Hearst, spelled H-U-R-S-T. And you'll be redirected to our horror fiction website and the author's profile there, where you'll find a link to her Amazon page and the book itself, as well as ways to connect with her and send her a kind word. If you decide to give any of K.B. Hearst's books a read, please consider giving her a quality review and a kind word. And be sure to let her know you heard about her here on this program and that Otis Jiry sent you. It would mean a lot to me. Thanks again for your support of this show and of tonight's featured author. Now, before we go, I would like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you've enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to choose Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram too. Just search for Otis Gyrie. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep, if you can. <laughs>Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, the Otis Jiry channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, Do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button 
to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>